Welcome to Innovation Dialogue. I'm Diana Ding. Today, uh, we are with Matt Mahan uh, from a entrepreneur and social entrepreneur to a elected official. Welcome, Matt. Thank you so much, Diana. It's great to be here with you. Oh, thank you. So Matt he was a tech entrepreneur. Now he served his first term on San Jose City Council as a District 10 council member, representing Almerton Valley, Blossom Valley, and the Vista Park neighborhoods. So what was your turning point? Just give us some background about yourself and from an entrepreneur become a elected official. Sure, yes. Well, you know, I grew up in Watsonville, which is on the central coast, a little farming town, which is where your strawberries come from for your, for your audience if they're not familiar. And when it was time for high school, I was growing up in a working class community. We were paycheck to paycheck every month. And our local public high school had a higher dropout rate than graduation rate. And my mother encouraged me to look at other options, to go out and find opportunity. I applied to a high school here in San Jose called Bellarmine, a, a college prep school. And I was very lucky to get in, but we couldn't afford the tuition. And they gave me a great opportunity. They said, if you work on the maintenance crew in the summers, we'll forgive your tuition. And so I took public buses every day, four hours a day round trip to come to San Jose to get a good education. And I really fell in love with our city. And I loved all of the opportunity that our city provides, safe neighborhoods, good schools, a diverse population, great weather, of course, great food. And I knew I wanted to come back. I was very lucky after my time here in high school to get a scholarship to go to Harvard. I went back east, met my future wife, Sylvia, there, and convinced her San Jose is the best place in the world to raise a family, and we came back, and I, I started as a public school teacher here. And I've always felt very close to community issues. I've always been interested in people's daily lives and how we can create more opportunity for everyone. So after teaching, I went into tech. I know we'll talk about that. But I think the turning point for me from being in tech to being in politics it was really just that I am interested in the big societal questions, education and health and the economy, and how do we create a thriving community that gives everybody, especially our children, opportunities for a better, for a better life. And politics is, is a, is a, has a lot to say about those opportunities. Mm -hmm. When you were in the tech company, actually your company is focused on the civic engagement. That's right. Yes, and also helping the, you know, under, uh, I would say, the, the grassroots uh, people. Yes. That's right. So uh, yes. the first company I was involved with, I, I joined when it was very small, just mm -hmm. seven people. It was one of the early Facebook applications, mm -hmm. one of the very first ones. And we built tools to help people use social media to connect with one another, support local nonprofits and charities, become volunteers. We actually helped raise over $50 million in small dollar donations for local nonprofits, helped millions of people get more civically engaged, and then went on to start my own company, which was the world's first nonpartisan voter engagement platform. Mm, so I can see that this is already in your blood. Uh, when you first, you know, when you're grown up and when you start your company, you always focus on the civic engagement and taking care of the people at the grassroots. Yes, I think mm -hmm. it's always been an interest for me because growing up in Watsonville, we had a lot of problems, mm -hmm. frankly. We had a high crime rate. Mm -hmm. We had a high unemployment rate. As I mentioned, many of our schools were not providing the, the level of education that people needed. And there were a lot of challenges, and I grew up reading the local newspaper, hearing my parents talk about some of the, their concerns, and I always wanted to figure out how do we make things better. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So actually, when you uh, ran for the city council in 2020, and you said that it's a time to government, local government, give them the wake-up call. So what is that wake-up call? You know, it's a great question. I decided to run for city council specifically because there are so many local issues that affect all of us. Crime, homelessness, high cost of housing, the state of our, our roads and traffic. And I felt that over the years, we've continued to raise taxes. We keep passing bonds. We've become a very expensive place to live. And yet, I don't feel that we're getting the results that we should be getting. We've seen issues like homelessness and crime get significantly worse. And what I have observed in local government 
is that we tend to do the same things and there's not always a lot of pressure to change our approaches, change our strategy when it's not delivering the outcomes we need. And I'll just give you an example of this. We are spending more than ever addressing homelessness and yet the number of people living outside on the streets keeps going up. If you look at how we're spending those dollars, we are mostly spending those dollars building brand new apartments mm -hmm. that cost over $800,000 per door mm -hmm. just to house one person. And I've argued that we should be using prefabricated modular units, investing in inpatient treatment options for addiction and mental illness, and moving people indoors in a much more scalable mm -hmm. and cost-effective way. But the, the, the point about the wake-up call is, unless voters get more engaged and more informed and ask tougher questions of the candidates for office and demand accountability for results, there's not enough of an incentive for our elected officials to actually admit when the things we're doing aren't working. And that's what I see today is we're trying to tell the public we're doing everything we can, but really many of our current policies are not working and we need to change those policies. Mm -hmm. What are the policies not, not working? Uh, can you give an example? Well, a few. I'll give you quite a few. So one is spending way too much per unit to house mm -hmm. somebody. Mm -hmm. The lack of inpatient treatment options for addiction and mental illness. We used to have a mental health hospital. We got rid of that mental health hospital, and now we have thousands of people living outdoors with severe mental illness. You know, yeah, why yeah. Get rid of that? Well, there was a lot of debate mm -hmm. many years ago, mm -hmm. and to be fair, there were some abuses in that system. There were some people who were held against their will for too long. There were some people whose civil liberties were violated, and so there was a movement to defund the mental health hospitals. The problem is if the alternative, which for far too many has been the case, is that people are living outside mm -hmm. with severe mental illness, that's not more humane. I'll give you another example of something that isn't working. We say that we have a housing crisis yes. and we need to build more housing. But if you look at our processes and our policies, we make it extremely difficult to build housing in yeah. San Jose and across really? the state of California, even where, where we really, where it makes sense to build housing. I, I, I agree with those who don't want to see us keep sprawling out and making traffic worse, but we have to build housing for our kids and our grandkids. And the way to do that is to build up in places like downtown San Jose and near our transit corridors so that we don't just put more cars on the road. But today, our environmental review processes can take a year, two years. Our fees can come out to over $100,000 per unit. We create, w w you know, we give people, developers, different feedback. We're inconsistent often on what we expect from them. We have a very high vacancy rate in our planning department. And so if we really think if this is our number one problem and our biggest crisis, then we need to act like it. And that means streamlining processes, keeping fees low, pre-clearing as much of the environmental and historical review as we can, fully staffing that department, investing in technology, and building a culture that's all about getting to yes, where we want to help investors build the housing where it makes sense as quickly as possible. I don't see us acting with that level of urgency in government mm, today. I see that. You mentioned about so many uh, issues in the city of San Jose, like homelessness, and crime and uh, dirty street and traffic and all those things. And what is the most, uh, you know, what's your priority? I think the, the most immediate challenge we face as a city that we have to turn the corner on is what I would call street homelessness, the number of people living outside. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned before, we're spending more than ever before, but today we have more people living outside than we ever have. And I think we need to learn... Is that because of more homeless people coming to the city, or is that because of... Most of our homeless population was last living at an address in our county. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that no one comes here, but, but for the most part, people who are homeless here were last living in an apartment or living indoors somewhere here uh, in our community. The, although, I will, I will say to that point, San Jose has far more than its fair share of the county's homeless population. 
So there is there is something there that we, we need a more fair distribution Be of the solutions. Because of the population is larger or because of? Well, more than our fair share. So San Jose is 50% of the county's population, but almost 70% of the homeless population in the county resides within San Jose. And part of it's that we're the big city, we have more land, but part of it is that neighboring cities are very tough on the homeless. They push people out. They don't allow living in an RV. They don't allow encampments. And while I understand why they do that, I don't think it's a real solution. I think that we need every city in our county, and frankly, every county in our state, to build basic shelter, mm -hmm. inpatient treatment facilities, mm -hmm transitional housing, and yes, permanent supportive housing, but today we're spending far too much of the money on the most expensive housing when the, the immediate crisis that we must address today is people living outside. And if you look at cities that have basically effectively ended street homelessness, in cities like New York and Boston, very low percentage of their homeless population actually lives outside on the streets because they are more pragmatic. They build much more cost-effective shelter and, and interim housing at scale, and the winter helps require people to come indoors. Mm, I see. Well, you were a business uh, owner, and you were, you know, from your background, you were a teacher, actually. I was yes. a teacher for a couple of years in Eastside San Jose, out in Alum yes. Rock, yeah, and then yeah. went into business. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. So, so what your, uh, you know, experience can really benefit what you're doing right now? Well, I think one of the things that I bring to the job of, of being an elected official is that I have had experiences, as, as you were pointing out, in other areas of life. Being a public school teacher connects you very closely with the community. Mm -hmm. You're getting to know the parents and grandparents and, and visiting people's homes and really having that, that deep connection. And you see the challenges that working families and, and their children face. As an entrepreneur, uh, it was almost at the other end of that where we're working at scale. We're thinking systemically about how to serve millions of people using our applications. I learned how to build a team and a strong team culture, how to collaborate with others to deliver a product for a customer. And I think in City Hall today, we could use a little more of that focus, goal setting. One of the things that, that was most powerful about being in, in business was we were able to organize our team around measurable outcomes that we all agreed were the most important things. And I, I want to bring more of that to City Hall. I think when we pass a budget in City Hall, which is a multi-billion dollar budget, by the way, I think your city council should set three to five strategic goals, reducing the crime rate, reducing the number of people living outdoors, speeding up our permitting processes, improving code enforcement, cleaning up the city with measurable targets, baselining where we are today, benchmarking against other cities, and having regular updates that's transparent to the public so you all can judge our performance. And I even think that we should be tying our pay raises as elected officials to how much progress we make against measurable goals. That's how things work in the business world. It's how a lot of nonprofits work. Government's the one place where we don't have that level of transparency and accountability. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, uh, even though, uh, you know, we have so many uh, high-tech professionals in this area. Your work, Wake Up Paul, is not only for the government. I, I should say it's also for the, our innovation community. <laughs> right. I think you're right. I think you make a really good point because mm -hmm. if the public sector mm -hmm. isn't functioning well, if we're not building housing, if we aren't maintaining our infrastructure, if we aren't business friendly and attracting employers, ultimately we all lose out. And there is a risk. Silicon Valley is a very special place but there is a risk that over time we could lose our competitive advantage as a region if we don't get public education, public infrastructure, housing policy. If we don't get those things right, we're going to see the future startups and entrepreneurs mm -hmm. go somewhere else. And we want to make sure that we keep our edge as a, as a region, which means the private sector has to get involved. Exactly. I think it's the ecosystem. It's not, uh, not only for the certain group, group of people. That's right. It's for the whole community and everybody stay together. Exactly. I yes. completely agree. 
Yes, that's so wonderful. So actually, you know, you are running for the mayor uh, of San Jose. You have a very strong competitor. Yeah. So what are you going to do differently than the others? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And we have run our campaign as a very grassroots, community-driven campaign. We have over 50 high school and college students from around the area who are helping to run the campaign. We have hundreds of volunteers. We've had almost 40,000 people go to mayhemforsanjose.com mm. to sign up for our revolution of common sense, we call our campaign. We've had hundreds of people now, over 300. How, how did you get those 40,000 people supporting you? I think, I think it's really two things. Mm. One is that I've done something that's a little bit unusual for a politician, which is being very willing to admit that the things we're doing in government aren't working right now. And there's a lot of frustration out there and people want honesty. They want to know why is it that we're spending more than ever, but we're not addressing homelessness? Why is it that crime has gotten worse and our neighborhoods are less safe? Why is it that we have a housing crisis, but we're not building housing? And I've been willing to point to specifically the policies we have in local government that are not working and offering new solutions, new approaches, a different way of doing business in government. And I think that's resonated with people. The other is that we've been out there every day doing the hard work of engaging people in their, in their neighborhoods and their small businesses. We've done over 300 meet and greet events in every neighborhood across the city and had thousands of people join us in person for small group conversations about these issues where we spend an hour or more just talking about the issues we face. And so I think that that education piece, the willingness to admit that what we're doing isn't working and we need change, and the fact that we have so many incredible volunteers and supporters, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a team effort. And even though we've been outspent, significantly. And even though I'm new to the political scene, you know, we started off about 25 points behind. In the primary, we were about seven points behind. And now the polling shows we're dead even because we have continued to get out this message of change, of focus, of accountability. And we just have an incredible team of grassroots supporters all over the city. Yeah, I can tell that. Uh, it's, that's, that's also the reason why you're here. My church brother, church friend, and actually, you know, speak really high of you. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, well, it's so an honor to be here. I appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah, really, I, I think that it's great that we really need someone that uh, understand the technology and also understand the you know the situation and willing to commit yourself especially the civic en engagement because I saw that from your path um, all the all these paths you've been really focused on this so why civic engagement is so important for you because I think it's the way that we make our community better mm -hmm. most of us spend most of our lives in our in our professional capacity, going to work, in our personal capacity, spending time with family and friends. But there's a third part of life, which you might call the civic or public life, mm -hmm. that we all have a responsibility for participating in. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a town that did not have as many opportunities because the community had struggles and needed more investment mm -hmm. and needed to invest in its children and improve education and support small businesses. And I really think that public policy matters. Mm -hmm. I think in the long run, public policy matters a lot because it involves education and safety and infrastructure and the, all of these key issues. And to get good public policy that works, we have to have the community engaged. Our whole system of government is, is based on the idea that it's of, by, and for the people. Ultimately, it shouldn't just be that you vote for someone and then assume that they're going to make all the right decisions. They have to keep hearing from you. You have to provide ideas and be engaged to produce better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yes. Actually, San Jose is uh, quite a diverse city. It is. Uh, yes. We, this is, I think, this is really the beauty of our uh, Silicon Valley. I agree. Uh, the, the diversity, the multicultural. Yeah. And uh, during the pandemic, we see that Asian hate crime and this happened. And so if you become the mayor, uh, what are you going to do to improve this? Yeah, great question. And, and first, let me say, I agree with you. I think that San Jose, what makes San Jose so special is that I don't think there's another city on earth that has done a better job of welcoming people from all over the world 
and offering them opportunity and upward mobility and a, and a higher quality of life. I, mean, I, it's, think, it's I a, think all the city have, you know, was think that we are the best yeah, place. Yeah, well, I think San Jose the, is the best. And I, yes. I think our diversity and the mm -hmm. fact that so many people have come here and found opportunity mm -hmm. and a better future for their children makes San Jose such mm -hmm. a special place. I would, I would take us up against any other city mm -hmm. on, that, on that metric. It, in terms of the, you mentioned Asian hate crimes. Yes. And I think there are a few things that, that we need to do going forward here. One is we have to continue to diversify our police force because having a police force that is reflective of the diversity of our community means that we will have better information, mm -hmm. better insight yes. into what's going on in each community. Mm -hmm. We will be able to more effectively partner with the community to address things like hate crimes targeting specific groups. We also have to use those policing resources. And frankly, San Jose needs to hire more police officers. We do not have enough police officers in San Jose. We have a shortage, uh, which we can talk about. But that'll be a priority for me. But I want to hire them so that they can be more engaged in the community, out in the neighborhoods, in our commercial districts. Be when we have capacity, we can do great police work. Then I'll give you an example that involves Asian hate crimes, Asian anti-Asian hate crimes. So in Little Saigon, there's a Grand Century Mall and the Vietnam Town Shopping Center. Our police department, because they have, uh, some of the members of the department have a very close relationship with, with the community and the business owners there, they learned about these um, purse snatchers. And what was happening was a, was a few criminals were targeting older Asian American women to mm -hmm. steal their, to knock them down and steal their purses. And the police department basically did a sting operation and used cameras and undercover officers and was, were able to actually apprehend and prosecute those individuals. But it, we, we only know about and are effective at, at doing that kind of policing to keep the community safe if our department reflects the diversity of the community and has the capacity to do good community policing and is actually out there and has relationships in the community. Mm, okay. So that'll be a priority for me. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, before we take off, and the last question is, uh, tell the voters why they should vote for you uh, in uh, one minute. Oh, wow. Well, I'm the only candidate who is really focused on accountability, that will run a city hall, that will set public goals, measure performance, admit when things that we're doing aren't working and change them faster in the spirit of innovation, which is what's made Silicon Valley so great. I'm very community oriented and have the diversity of experiences as a public school teacher and someone who has built companies to bring a different perspective to government. And I think this is a time when we need change in government, in the way that we approach problems. And I'm gonna make sure we're accountable for delivering the outcomes we need less homelessness, more housing, less crime, better streets, less traffic. We will be accountable because that's what I've done through my entire career, has been accountable for results. Okay, thank you. And today we're with Matt Mahan. He's running for the mayor of San Jose. Thank you, good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.